Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the November 2nd, 2020 work session of the Salisbury City Council. We have several items on the agenda tonight. Uh, first up is the budget amendment to accept funds for repairs to a zoo vehicle and Ben Baker field operations deputy director of service is going to present. Ben, it's all yours. <laughs> um, so yeah, the Department of Field Operations, um, we had an incident down at the zoo with one of our vehicles and um, the funds uh, should have been sent uh, to the actual um, vendor doing the repairs. However, the uh, funds were sent to the general fund. Uh, so we're just requesting that that insurance adjustment, um, the $848.50 um, be transferred uh, to the zoo vehicle account um, so we can um, go ahead and further use those funds in an efficient manner. Thank you, Ben. Questions or comments from the council, Mr. Boda? No questions or comments and uh, move it forward, please. Thank you. Ms. Jackson? No question, comments and move it forward. Thank you. Ms. Blake? Same thing, no questions or comments and please move this forward. Thank you. Uh, we have, since there's no questions, comments, and we have agreement uh, to move it forward, Ms. Nichols, please put it on the agenda. Next up is the budget amendment to accept Maryland Bikeways grant agreement. Will White from the Department of Infrastructure and Development, Transportation Project Specialist, will present. Will, good evening. Good evening. How is everybody tonight? Um, we have two or recently rewarded two bikeways grants. Um, they are both for design. Um, we will be initiating those projects hopefully soon. And it covers the design of a bikeway along College Avenue, as well as a rail or the first phase of the rail trail, which is the most southern phase uh, from Fruitland heading to Milford Street. Um, these are 80% grants, so there is a 20% match on our end as called out in the memorandum in the ordinance. Um, but other than that, we've had gratefully money is approved to be moved. We can begin. Great. Th thank you, Will. Uh, questions or comments? And should we move it forward, Mr. Boda? Um, really great to see uh, continuing to move forward with these uh, bikeways. Uh, just a great added benefit to our citizens, especially uh, encourage people to exercise and uh, use uh, alternate modes of transportation. So I support this and uh, let's, let's uh, move it forward. Thank you, Mr. Boda. Ms. Jackson? Um, I support it and move it forward. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. Ms. Blake? Definitely support it and please move it forward. Thank you. Uh, I also support it. So we'll move this forward. Uh, Mrs. Nichols, that can appear on the next agenda. Thank you, Will. Thank you. Next, we have a uh, whole drive annexation agreement. Um, our director, permits and inspector manager, Bill Holland, will run us through that. Good afternoon, Bill. Good afternoon. It's good, good to see everyone again. It's been a while. Um, we're bringing back this Hall Drive long property annexation uh, before it goes to uh, a public hearing. Uh, the property went to the Salisbury White Comic Planning Commission back in February and got rezoned to R8A. Uh, this annexation will add a little over an acre to city corporate limits and will uh, definitely have a net positive impact to the city. Uh, once the property is developed, uh, it will have a value of approximately $1.2 million with an expected revenue of approximately $12,120 and an estimated annual cost of approximately $4,500. Uh, the annexation would have a positive fiscal impact of uh, approximately $7,500 a year. Uh, <clears throat> the owner agrees that the site uh, will, has, has to go back to the planning commission before development, which will include um, landscaping. Uh, it will also a five foot sideway sidewalk along Hall Drive. Additionally, the owner agrees to pay a development assessment fee of uh, $3,650 per dwelling unit. 
uh, this, this money is used for uh, beautification, restoration, revitalization of existing uh, neighborhoods. Uh, the annexation, annexation plan is, uh, is proposed of two buildings, one that faces uh, South Division Street and one on Hall Drive. Um, one will contain four units and the other uh, six units. It also includes stormwater management facilities, enclosed dumpster area, and an open uh, recreation site. That's 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 it. Thank you, Bill. Appreciate it. Uh, questions or comments, and so we move it forward, Mr. Boda. Um, no, no questions. Uh, just great to see this moving forward. Uh, I know this has been uh, on the on the burner for a couple of years, and. Uh, so uh, happy to see this and uh, I completely support it. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. I concur with the mayor and I'm um, moving forward. Thank you, Ms. Blake. Same thing. I totally agree and please move it forward. Yeah, I think it'll be a welcome addition to that neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, we only have one other sore spot on that street, uh, which I think we're all aware of. And if we could uh, get something done with that, we'd be in great shape. Um, uh, so I, I agree to move it forward. Um, this is Nichols, please make sure that's on the next agenda. Thank you, Bill. Okay, right, have a good evening. Uh, next up, we have a bylaw amendment for the Human Rights Advisory Committee and uh, Deputy Mayor and City Administrator Julia Flanzas, I think, is handling that one. No? Good afternoon, Council. I'm actually going to yield my time to Laura Boslin, who is the uh, staff representative for this group and who wrote the memo. I apologize, Laura. I have, I have Julia's name on here. Don't, don't apologize. Um, hi, everyone. So as liaison for the Human Rights Advisory Committee, I reached out to Julia um, in her capacity as acting mayor because the committee would like to make two changes to their bylaws. The first change is that they would like to alter the language that currently reads that they are required to have a high school student as a member. And they would like to change that to be worded at least one youth representative aged 16 to 24 years. And they feel this change is necessary because it's difficult to recruit a high school student with all the demands that are currently on their plate and then high school students tend to graduate and move away and no longer serve the committee. So they feel that they could still meet the needs of having a youth voice without that person necessarily being a high school member, although they still could be. And the second change is they'd like to shorten their term limits from four years to two, because they feel that four years is a significant commitment that deters people from wanting to sign on to the committee and that the committee has got um, got the risk of going stale after some time and that it would be a good idea to stagger terms by rotating on newer perspectives more frequently. Great. Thank you, Laura. Absolutely. Uh, Mr. Boda, questions or comments? Uh, that all sounds good. Thank you, Laura, for your hard work and I support this. Thank you. Ms. Jackson? Um, Laura, I, I want to make sure I'm correct. You said one youth representative and they have to be six, 16 years old? At least age 16 is the way the committee has currently defined youth. Yeah, ages 16 to 24. Okay, uh, um, move forward. Thank you. Ms. Blake? I concur, move it forward. Thank you. Laura, I think they're good moves. Uh, I, I particularly like the staggered term, so there's always mm -hmm. someone with experience on the, uh, on the committee. Are they set up that way now? The original bylaws are written that terms need to be staggered and because it's taken a while to reach full membership on the committee, they are currently all staggered. Great. Thank you very much. Okay. And I agree to move it forward. Mrs. Nichols, we can move this forward up to the next agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. Next up, uh, we have a discussion which is going to be led by uh, Deputy City Administrator Andy Kittrow, and that's re relative to neighborhood revitalization incentive program discussion. Andy, you have the floor. Great, um, if you will indulge me, I'd like to share my screen so we can go through a presentation together. Okay. <clears throat> All right, everybody should see a screen that's neighborhood reinvestment, neighborhood revitalization incentive program. Everybody got that? 
Great. Um, also, um, I may be uh, yielding some time or some comment to our Director of Housing and Community Development, Ron Strickler, um, since this falls within our neighborhood outreach and programming um, and some reinvestment. Uh, he may be uh, a great asset to speak to some of the things that we're currently doing um, and just also give a landscape of uh, our current property so that we have in our inventory and potentially acquisition if that comes up in the conversation. So um, you may or may not know, uh, this is new for Angela uh, and it would have been new for Michelle if she was on, um, but in 2017, um, Thea Williams actually uh, had a similar presentation on August 7th to work session. Um, a, it was called a plan for neighborhood reinvestment. And you went over some of, some of this, this stuff. Um, specifically in his presentation, which was, which was pretty robust, he talked about some statistics. Um, and, and really GIS specific, so location based. And, and those um, findings were based off of these three categories, um, VID properties, which is vacant, abandoned and deteriorated properties. Um, it also looked at um, calls for service from the PD and also looked at juvenile crime. So when we look, pulled up those maps and looked at what was happening in these, these heat maps, you saw some concentration of, of, of items, um, not causational, but a little bit of core Correlators, they were correlated, if I can use that word correctly. Um, but what will happen from that? We targeted three neighborhoods, the three areas. Um, the Church Street area, slash hey, Riverdale, uh, Camden Heights, North Camden. Hey, and then California. pretty good. Can I finish the slide? Go ahead. Andy, it was, it was somebody not needed, so keep going. Oh, sorry, that's okay. Um, California, uh, Southwest side. Um, so uh, those neighborhoods, which we know, um, they've been for a lot of our discussions um, of recent. So I've been here since 2017, and, and this is what we've accomplished since I've been here with different members of our team. Um, we've identified neighborhood leaders. Uh, when Mr. Lindsay was with us, he created a very robust um, list of all of our, our neighborhood leaders and stakeholders and, and our different neighborhoods, over 80 different neighborhoods were identified. We've been having several different neighborhood walks and community barbecues um, to you know, go out, knock on doors, pass out information, hear from residents of these communities. Um, and then specifically, we've had some facility improvements and development. We've had a financial commitment into some of the infrastructure. As you guys know, the Troy Street Community Center, Newton Community Center, which is coming online here hopefully within a month. And then the Waterside Park and playground improvements. You've seen the new fence go up. We're going to be putting in a, um, a parking lot and doing some uh, field improvements here soon. But really while we're talking is, is what's next, this property reinvestment piece. I mean, that's what we wanted to spend most of our time talking about. Because it, not only with revitalization, you need to invest in the programming and the people, but you also need to invest in the property, the physical structures that, that, um, that people live in. So we've got several different categories of property reinvestment that we're gonna look into. And one of those is increasing home ownership. That's a really big piece to what Theo uh, touched on and what we're gonna highlight again today is we need to have home ownership in our neighborhoods, our target areas. We need people, we need that buy-in into that property. Um, of the neighborhood that, uh, that's drawn here, that is the California Southwest Side neighborhood, um, the, the topic of discussion. Um, there's about 230 parcels in that neighborhood 10% of them are owner occupied. That's how much residential or corporate property is there. But, but most of this is rentals. There's only 10 homeowners, 10% uh, of the entire uh, area that, that was focused that April wanted us to look at. Um, some ways that you can increase home ownership is through some uh, strong stakeholders or community partnerships um, and habitat and neighborhood housing services, which everybody is very familiar with. We've actually invited them to the next work session and they're gonna be providing a couple presentations on specifically what they're doing to um, increase home ownership and working with different families on, on some programming. So I won't steal their thunder. Um, we'll have them talk in a couple weeks uh, to the whole group. Um, the next is financial incentives. So this is what currently exists um, and it's at a federal level. Uh, most people are familiar with this. There's low income housing tax credit programs. And you, I won't read through all the detail there, uh, but you can see what is eligible for housing. Um, but there are 
a lot of these neighborhoods do have qualifying properties, um, whether um, the individual or the redevelopers are um, um, using these incentive tax credit programs right now. Um, we have a little bit, but, but not a lot of movement necessarily right now with, with these programs, but they do exist at a federal level. It, it is an, an initiative. Um, one thing that we did start up in the beginning of 2017 was a Salisbury City of Salisbury fee moratorium. Um, every year, this council approves to continue this program, and it has been uh, successful in, in continuation. Um, when this comes before you, it's usually considered like infill um, housing. Um, but what's very specific about it is it's a single family owner occupied detached dwelling. So if people are going to build houses, they can get a lot of their fees waived, building permit fees, which can add up. And that can be the margins uh, when, it, when it comes to uh, um, building a property. And that's literally what people have taken advantage of off of Beagland Park and some of these new developments. Um, what's interestingly enough, um, specifically in the neighborhood that I talked about earlier, we have on the city's Rolodex several vacant properties. Um, so if you have a vacant property that has no building on it, there's a chance to, you know, we will be putting back an infill. So those properties when turned back over to the tax rolls and private investors could potentially build on those properties and receive some of our current incentives that we have on the books, um, which is part of our, our process. Um, and if anybody has any questions specifically about our inventory that we have in that neighborhood, Ron, again, is here to be able to answer some of those questions. So what are the, what else is out there? And this is, um, you know, what April was interested in. So we have our fee moratorium. We could look at the details of that program. Um, we could revise it or we could create a new incentive program, something that waives some fees or some, some other hurdles that people maybe have to go through. Um, we could get into the details of that if we wanted to. Um, we could also re revise or rehab, uh, uh, sorry, revise and or rehab a revitalization and tax abatement, abatement program. So any sort of tax credit. What we're doing with the Horizon program, which are really focusing on large scale development, there's an opportunity if there's an interest here to, to consider some sort of level of abatement to um, rehab and revitalization. Uh, Laurel, Maryland has a, a very robust tax credit program for rehab properties. Um, and rehab properties are currently um, legislated at the state level and are approved. So there's an opportunity there if we want to incentivize um, some of that. We can also allocate grant funds if we wanted to. I think uh, back in 2013, 2014, um, we used CDBG money. Uh, that's community development block grant funds to be able to either finance some home ownership incentives, down payment, not down payments, um, closing costs or some rehab opportunity or um, funding and sending funding to some of our local partners, which we've done in the past, Habitat Humanity, Salisbury Neighborhood Housing. So there's an opportunity to not necessarily ourselves, but to allocate to a third party and then have them do that. Um, and then there's also, you know, the other categories or anything else that we haven't considered yet or thought about that may be that uh, a golden ticket to help incentivize some revitalization in our target areas. So that's the incentive program. We talked about home ownership. So if we take a step back and look at the really large scale ideas, when you look at some of the communities nationally who are doing some big full scale revitalization, not property by property, but neighborhood or community at a time, they start looking at these bigger concepts, which are land banks and land trusts. And this is maybe a new com, uh, conversation for some of you. So I'm going to tap into the slide a little bit more in detail um, so that everybody's familiar. But land banks are a public entity, usually public nonprofit or governmental entity, which specializes in the conversion of vacant, abandoned, foreclosed properties and productive use. So if we have a whole bunch of properties in a Rolodex or identified properties through a land bank, bank this separate entity, they can, in a sense, uh, acquire these properties, have them on their bank, and then figure out how to repurpose those properties. But what's the most interesting about it um, is what these opportunities are. Oh, sorry. Is down here, 
And some of these legislative powers, we'd have to look at this. Some of this stuff is uh, allowed in Maryland. Some of this stuff would be locally legislated. But what's interesting about land banks is through the, um, a lot of times it's through a ban. Uh, so on the very first bullet, uh, obtain property at low or cost through the tax foreclosure process. A lot of times when there is um, tax sale, the property is up for auction and people can bid on it. There's ways that you can create um, a land bank to be kind of head of the class to go to the front of the line to be able to get properties in target areas. So you can create an opportunity um, that allows us strategically, if we wanted to, to be able to improve areas with a specific purpose through a land bank. Land, but again, land banks aren't necessarily 100% uh, governmental, you have private partnerships with landowners or other investment groups and the city has a seat on it so that you create this uh, this nonprofit or, or entity that kind of um, negotiates on your behalf and buys and sells to be able to have this common purpose. A lot of really cool things are happening here. If we want to ever dive deep into land banks, there's a whole presentation on just that specifically. Complementary is land trusts, not to be confused with land banks. Um, a community land trust are traditional nonprofits that, that hold land in the trust. So an example would be the Lower Shore Land Trust. It exists right here, but it's primarily an agricultural one. What's a, what would be a good use to, reason to have a land trust? If we wanted to have a target area and we wanted to ensure in perpetuity that that property was going to be for affordable housing, or it was going to be for X. We could move that property into a land trust in perpetuity so that whoever comes on to redevelop it later on has to only develop X. So without, so the redevelopment outlives the current owner of it or the current developer of it. So this could prevent some potential gentrification or other undue consequences down the road. Um, as I mentioned, these are complementary, so you can't have a land trust and a land bank together. You can have both of those, and some communities take advantage of both of those things. And you can read through some of these items right here. Um, so I think this is actually a really interesting piece when you think about some of our target areas um, as, as how, of, of ways to, if we wanna look at it holistically, between land banks and land trusts are our ways to look at this. And then my final slide is about resources. Um, the Center for Community Progress is a national company and they hold a whole bunch of conferences. I went to one my first year I was here. I mean, and their tagline is vacant spaces into vibrant places. They're really interested in making sure the blight of communities is turned into assets. I mean, you can read what their uh, mission statement is right now and then there's their website, but they are a great resources. We wanna go down this path to not only pull some of their uh, major publications and documentations that they have or sit in on webinars, um, but some of their conferences give us a lot of great information, have a lot of great resources of the people on a national level, what they are doing. Um, and then an anecdotal story, a story out of uh, Austin, Texas is Restore Rundberg. Um, their kind of slogan is neighborhoods helping neighborhoods, not specifically in the reinvestment on a on a large scale in terms of taxpayer money or private equity. Um, but what they do is, is their individuals within these neighborhoods are taking the ownership of making sure that they take care of their neighborhoods and even those surrounding neighborhoods. It's a really cool um, program that's based out of Austin, Texas. Um, and I think there's a lot of cool things. So if we needed a contact or as we think about what we wanna do long-term, they're a good resource to, to reach out to and, to and just, you know, pick their brain for some information. So that's it. Um, I wanted to be brief and just give some high level uh, comments and I'm open to questions from the council. And again, we have Ron at our disposal. Jack, you're muted. Sorry, I didn't want to interrupt. Uh, thank you, Andy. There's a lot of good information in here. Um, and I think that uh, we can certainly take some activity pretty quickly 
Um, I'll call the roll and ask if, if everybody has questions, because uh, I have a couple. So, uh, Mr. Boda, do you have any questions? No, but I, I think maybe a, uh, a presentation or discussion on land banks uh, in the future would be uh, one good uh, thing to take a look, look at and consider as an option. Yeah, I agree. Ms. Jackson? Um, I really don't have any questions, but I will do some research because I've taken some pictures of the slides so I could go a little bit more in depth into the land banks and the land trusts. Um, but other than that, you know, everything seems to be okay. Good. Thank you. Uh, Andy, could you send that presentation out to all the council members, please? Yep, I can do that. Um, Thank you. And just real quick, land banks and land trusts, great ideas. They can take several months to stand up. So if, if we're interested in that, um, it, there's a pro, it's a long process, but it's a, I think it's a well worth venture to, to consider. Ms. Blake? Um, when was the last time, or do we currently have any monies um, either to Habitat for Humanity or Salisbury Neighborhood Housing out of the uh, CDBC monies? Do we have any currently? Good, good question, Angela. Um, so every year we get CDBG uh, funding. Um, and, and what the city has done since I've been here is every other year we have had this open round of funding um, to bring in the community stakeholders to be able to apply for a certain amount. Um, this year's round will be open again for funding. And we know that Habitat and Salisbury Neighborhood Housing have both showed interest. Um, a couple years ago, this past year, um, it was closed. We, we used that funding for some other projects, but the year before Habitat was awarded um, CDBG money, it was in the range of 90,000 to 100,000. I can't, don't quote me on it, but uh, but they got a, about a third of the money that was available uh, for, for an application. It is an open round application um, where anybody can apply with their project. Um, and then we have a, a review process, but yeah, we typically have done every other. So this year coming up would be one of those years. So this, so this coming up year, like 2021, both Salisbury neighborhood housing and habitat would, I guess, apply for a piece of that pie. I suppose you're yeah, they can apply in any other nonprofit who had, who meets the criteria mm -hmm. and apply, but they're usually the big ones. Okay. And Angela, um, I think it's important to note that we do have a line item in the budget for Salisbury Neighborhood Housing Services. I think it's almost around $50,000. Um, so we have been contributing to them for many, many years. And, and that helps with closing costs? Yes, yes. Mainly, I think their closing cost program in um, their three target neighborhoods in the city. Um, okay. Excellent. And thank you. Thank you, Angela. Um, a couple of things that I have. Uh, one, you know, there's short term, medium term, and long term. And I think we should not exclude anything. So uh, about the land grant, I understand that we should get going on that so that we're in the line. Uh, the immediate one that I see is tax abatement. Um, and I think we should get, try to get, we should be able to get a, um, copy of the Laurel Maryland program. Uh, and if we can't, we can, we can go through MML, MML and probably uh, get that. Uh, but I think that would be a good starting point because uh, essentially that's a self, that's a self in incentive to say, hey, look at, I'm gonna spend this much money uh, and, and I'm going to get, I'm not going to have to pay taxes for a while in order to get that money back. So I think that that's a, that's a great idea. The other thing that I was thinking about, when you talk about habitat and, and neighborhood housing, you're talking about one house at a time. The other night I was thinking about it. There should be a program where we can get donors and sponsors and people helping us out. Sorry. Um, to um, get some funding where 
somebody just made a may need to have a paint job. Yeah. You know, instead of having, you know, you build, you put a lot of money into one house and you get somebody into a brand new house, essentially. I, I'm all for that. We should keep doing it. But there are houses. I went down uh, Fitzwater, Delaware the other day and I saw three or four houses at a good paint job which would do a lot. And, and how can we, where can we get some money to do that? And because you can't do, obviously the abatement program wouldn't work for that. Hmm. Like a restoration but, fund or restore fund or a... Yeah, you know, um, have, a, have a, a paint party. We'll buy the paint and the neighbors come out and help somebody paint their house. Can I weigh, can I weigh in on this, Andy? Please, John. That's when, um, so the, the issue specifically when you're talking about uh, along Fitzwater, Andy spoke to it. So 10%, roughly 10%, if it even is 10% of that specific area. I know I actually toured Fitzwater today uh, to look at a couple of properties that GNI is interested in donating to the city. Um, when it comes to grant funding, um, it's really hard to use that grant funded money because those properties are not owned by the homeowner. They are owned by a landlord and that landlord is then making money off of that property. So it really comes back around is how do you hold the landlord accountable to make sure that they're maintaining their property to the standards or making their properties look nice. Um, and because you can't use that grant funding to benefit a business, right? So now I'll give an example because we're looking at it. There's a property in Newtown right now that we know as an elderly individual uh, that just can't do the work on her property. Now she is a homeowner, so we're considering taking some, diverting some funds um, as a community project through HCDD. Because it is a homeowner, we can utilize that because we can prove that they're on a set budget um, and that they don't have the, the funds available to do that project and we can utilize some of those funds. So that's kind of the issue when you, when you look at it from that standpoint, how do you do these small projects? Um, you know, and I think you talked about it in a larger scale, um, but even in a smaller scale is there are nonprofit builders out in, in the, in the, uh, in the space. We don't have a lot of nonprofit builders per se here on the Eastern shore. Uh, early on when I started with the city, one of my first meetings I took was with a group um, out of uh, the Newark, Newcastle, Delaware area. One of their major projects with Newark, Delaware uh, was to do a Main Street revitalization. Now, all, all businesses are looking to make some type of money from the projects they do. But the big thing with them and their project with Newark was that uh, they had these tax differentials or these abatements where, you know, they got, they were able to do these projects for a much lower cost because they weren't being charged the permit fees, the tax fees. The first couple of years, there was this, you know, differential. And I did meet with that group and they do have interest in the city of Salisbury. And we did tour these areas, specifically uh, the Hill. Um, and because uh, that was kind of one of the things I want to do is try and identify large scale builders that would come in and, you know, we're not doing one house at a time, but we're doing an entire area. Um, keeping in mind that we have these communities and we have this deep history where we don't want to recreate that neighborhood, but we want to provide housing that's affordable in that area for the same individuals that are living there. Um, I watched a pro I watched a presentation from a college student at SU and she was talking about, uh, you know, the, I'm trying to think of this would be the west side of Fitzwater mm -hmm. looking across the street at this very nice new complex of of housing um, and wanting that level of housing and, and um, you know how can we provide that and I think that's through building these pri private public partnerships where we get the support of these private entities and how can we support that as a government agency so we, well, the big thing would be identifying those those contractors or those groups that are interested in that type of work. Um, but I know I went a little bit off the smaller scale, but I just wanted to kind of talk about some of the things that we're doing on our end to help identify opportunities. <clears throat> Thanks, Ron. I appreciate it. Um, I'm going back because I'm stubborn and I keep uh, 
once I get an idea, I want to yeah. I want to want to make sure that we try to execute it. Right. Could we get a list of those areas, the map that you showed, Andy? And I'm sure we have a map for the other areas, and give us a count of how many private, privately owned <laughs> homes. And I think that as a beginning, uh, we should, you know, I, I know a few guys I can sort of pressure a little bit to, to give up some time and some materials and maybe have a paint party like on a, on a person's house. Who owns a house? There's got to be people there who own houses. Actually, I know there are because I know three people right away that own their own homes mm -hmm. that, that, that need painting, for instance, or caulking on the win windows or something. And you're not talking about tremendous big bucks there. You're talking about paint and labor. So if you could, if somebody could get us the number, total number of houses in, in the area, number of rentals, number of homeowners. And then let me work on that a little bit and touch base with some people and see, see what I can come up with. Um, the more people that are working on this, the better. Because I think I think we shouldn't attack just one area. We should attack every possible area. Because God knows we need it. You know, to, to go by and see a sound house that needs a couple of coats of paint. That's, fr that's very frustrating. And you'd be surprised if one person paints the house in an area, what that does to the rest of the neighborhood. Um, I was born and raised in Newark, right. New Jersey. And we had a sim they had a similar program that was run by veterans. And I can remember some of the houses, man, they were in bad shape. But the vets would go out and actually paint a house at a time. And we take collections up to pay for the paint. Where there's a will, there's a way. That's what I'm saying. And I think that we've, we've got, we started this process moving. And I think we should keep it going. And I think attack on all fronts should be the way we're doing it. This is a great start. Um, Jack, um, could, could I say something? Sure. Because I know that area pretty good, pretty well. Um, a lot of those houses are not in good condition, not in great condition at all. Um, there are a few, and I do know a few of the homeowners that do own property there. But my main thing is not just painting a house and not just caulking, but renovating these houses completely. I myself personally, and I'm going to be, I'm going to be quite frank. People are living where they have to live because they can't afford to live anywhere else. And I'm the type of person I want people to live in suitable housing. I want people to live healthy. I want them to live safe. And a lot of these houses are not safe. And a lot of these landlords know their houses are not safe and they're not suitable and refuse to do anything about it. And it's time for the city, not just in this area, but every area of Salisbury to do what needs to be done to make this right for the people who we represent. And this is just how I feel. I, I, I don't mean just my district, but every district in the city of Salisbury is being represented here today. And I feel as though that these people should live according to how everybody else lives. If, if, I, if I'm living good, I want everybody else to live good. If I'm living safe, I want everybody else to live safe. I don't have to worry about rain coming in my apartment. I don't have to worry about my power off because of too many lines running to this and too many lines running to that. These are the kind of situations these people are living with. I have witnessed it. I've had many complaints. April, I, 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 could, I couldn't agree with you 100% no, more. I, 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 um, I, just, I just don't think that it's, the paint's going to cause, going to make the difference. I think um, us um, putting our feet down and doing what's right by the people. I just don't yeah, think Jack, that. Can I, I, I talk about something? Oh, go ahead, Jack. I'm sorry. Sure. No, go ahead. No, I was going to say, uh, you know, one of the things, if you've got, you know, properties that have issues, uh, I use the, uh, 
the GIS thing on the city website, the, the problem uh, link and uh, for properties. And uh, we had a, a one particular in our neighborhood and, uh, uh, you know, went in, I took a whole bunch of pictures, uploaded it and, and Ron, your people uh, got on it. And uh, I would say within three or four days, uh, the property owner was back at that property. Uh, they cut the grass, they got rid of the bushes, they painted it, they put up handrails, uh, and now they're trying to rent. Uh, so I, I think that's that's sometimes where if we've got specific properties that you know are, are not owner occupied, but we know that they're problem properties, and especially if they're vacant, because some there's there's probably some vacant homes in some of these neighborhoods. Uh, don't be afraid to use that. And and because it works, and, uh, no, and they get on it, and, and they handle it. <coughs> the only last uh, final thoughts I'd like to make is, you know, I ran some numbers over here. Over one third of the properties owned in that area, if you exclude Purdue, are owned by three companies. So, so that's a lot of um, of property. They have to be at this table when we talk about these bigger conversations. And yeah. I'm not saying that they have to make yeah. out, but they're businesses. So we have to at least have a conversation with them. And one of the ways through the abatements is, you know, the current traditional model is you incentivize the homeowner. However, if we want to incentivize redevelopment, if we want to re-incentivize, um, you know, these rehab projects, but at the same time try to prevent price escalation or gentrification, there has to be the numbers have to tumble with with these developers or these investors. So there is an opportunity to look at that. You do this on a large scale on your properties. There could be some incentive for that. Yes, they are privately owned businesses, but ultimately it still makes the neighborhood look better and, and, and be better. And whether that's a rent freeze or a re rent escalation, like don't come in here, we'll give you money to rehab and then you double rent. I mean, there has to be some sort of potential there because I don't think we're gonna make 90% of these properties homeowner occupied. So that, I mean, rentals are gonna be a primary piece, I think in Salisbury moving forward. But again, there's gotta be hopefully this partnership or cooperation with um, individual landlords or the larger companies that own several properties. Um, and I think, you know, one was already named here and they're already looking at helping uh, with the city in different capacities. So I think there's more, we just have to bring them to the table and figure out what makes sense that's beneficial for them, but also us as a city. Andy, I think that's a great idea. And um, especially now, uh, this last year, I forget what the date was when the when the state uh, stopped uh, their uh, subsidizing on the uh, eastern shore, and everything was taken to Baltimore, uh, Baltimore County, like and Baltimore it. City, and that hurt us because mm -hmm. that really essentially stopped all the new uh, low income housing that we had uh, been working on for several years since I've been on the uh, on the council. Um, and that hurts. So I think that that's a great idea to get the, uh, get everybody at the table, all the stakeholders and say, how can we do this? How can we achieve this? Because ultimately it's going to be good for everybody. Mm -hmm. It's going to be good for the landlords as well. Uh, but there has to be some give and take. And, um, obviously that's a function of, of, uh, the city, uh, under the uh, executive branch. And we would look to support it any way we could, but um, I think uh, I think that's another step we can certainly take. Um, so if I could summarize, um, not necessarily in any in any order, but uh, we should look at the meeting with the landlords. You guys should look at the meeting with the landlords. We should look at the abatement program for homeowners, and get a copy of Laurel's. Uh, program and see what that looks like. And then um, we got our presentations from uh, neighborhood housing and habitat. And then uh, we'll just keep going until we come up with some solutions. 
works for us. And if I could just add one thing, I know I spoke to this previously, but this chunk of money we have, this grant that we have right now for revitalization, demolition, all that, uh, the different aspects we have. Again, our goal or my goal for this department moving forward is to continue to generate funds through our revitalization efforts that we have this continuous pot of funding, uh, whether it's through acquisition, through donation, and then working with community churches or community members to get that donated time, that donated material. And then ultimately, we benefit, the city benefits or HCDD benefits from the sale of the property, knowing that it's going to be a single family home for a five year period uh, before it can do anything else. And we take those funds and we just continue to roll those funds over into an account that's specific for revitalization efforts. And I think we can see that pot continue to grow especially with, with um, the, you know, what, the RFP that, is, that, will, that went out, you know, for um, realtor service support uh, to help with the sale and the acquisition of properties um, to streamline those efforts. Uh, so I, I really do think that if we can get this project rolling, we'll continue to see that funding to do these projects you're speaking of uh, with the painting and, and that type of thing. So I think we're moving in the right direction, kind of steering away from, hey, we're going to demolish this property. If we have an opportunity to rebuild and benefit from it and the community benefits from it, it's a win-win for everyone. Agreed. Okay. Um, that concludes with everything that was on the agenda. Uh, we could have some closing remarks from the council. Mr. Boda. Good to see everyone tonight. Uh, uh, just, uh, you know, once again, just everybody get out and vote tomorrow. Uh, if you've got your ballot, make sure you drop it in a box or, or get it in the mail uh, and, uh, and cast your vote. Uh, no vote is a wasted vote, no matter who you vote for. Uh, the uh, other thing is keep supporting our businesses, our restaurants, and uh, uh, hope to see uh, everybody Friday at the uh, ribbon cutting uh, on, on Main Street. So it's exciting. Uh, so uh, see you all then. Thank you, Mayor. April? Um, I would just like to say, give my grandson who passed this year his birthday's today, so I'd like to wish him a happy birthday. Happy birthday, Gerard. My mom misses you. Um, and I'm like, Mia, please vote tomorrow. Your voice is heard in your voice and vote. So please get out and vote tomorrow. Polls open seven to seven. So make you make sure you get there. Thank you, April. Mm -hmm. Angela. Um, it's just really nice to hear the city planning and um, considering um, all these housing options and improving the quality of life in, uh, in regards to housing and the housing opportunities for our residents. That's, that's really good that we're moving forward with a lot of different ideas. Um, obviously, if you're healthy enough, please um, donate blood and please wear your mask, please. Mm -hmm. Please continue yeah. to be safe in this time of COVID. Thank you, Angela. Yeah, I, uh, I agree. Uh, wear your masks, uh, give blood if you can, vote, vote, vote. It, it's a very important election um, and uh, every vote counts, every vote. So uh, thank you all for your participation today. April, thank mm -hmm. you for uh, keeping the pressure on us and being <laughs> the conscious at, on this side of the uh, council and we appreciate it. Thank you. Um, and with that, ladies and gentlemen, we are adjourned. Thank you, everyone, for Good your participation. Good evening. Good evening.